what? Okay, so you have to send me that. Your Promise. mind is going to go like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm Crazy. so happy that you're as obsessed with food as I am. It's like- it's I am too. Food. It's fun to talk about things that are actually like interesting too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You always wear it on podcasts. You're like, uh, what right. are we going to talk about myself? Right, right. God almighty, why? Right. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to make you do that a little bit. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I know. As okay, boring as you are to you, you're interesting to other people. So that's the part you got to- and one thing that I love, part of the reason that I love sport is that every person's journey in sport is by definition unique, which is fascinating. Yeah, that's a, re- wow. That's a really good point. There's no one line or to the success that you find or the lessons and doesn't matter who you are. doesn't matter what's because the sport might be, well, I mean, all sports are unique. Mm-hmm. Figure skating and judo, totally mm-hmm. different. And then there's all, always a connection. And then there's, you know, I'll start by sort of beginning to explain a little bit of what I know about you. Okay. And then you can tell me what I missed and screwed up and then and educate me on what I got wrong and go from there. Um, so today I'm with Jadine, Jadine Ferreira. And so you're, you're a let's see, personal performance coach, national level choreographer for over 15 years for, for skating. Um, you have a degree in psychology and you got the coach achievement award from Canada, skate Canada in 2018. And I'm guessing there's lots of other things that I missed or don't have fully. So I'd love to, for you to explain a little bit about yourself. Well, I fell in love with art and music and dancing from the beginning of being on this planet And I had no idea that it could turn into a career or it could turn into any kind of service for anybody because nobody says in their business plan, well, you're just going to wave your arms around and make money and feed yourself. But somehow I did that and um, created a whole career in choreography over the last 20 years in figure skating. So it's morphed now into um, much more business consulting and so on, because I'm realizing that the skill set that I created with pulling art out of people is the same that you do when you're pulling out business ideas or confidence or branding. And so it's really fun now to take this whole idea of skating success to another level. Right. And so you started, you started in dance and then got into figure skating. Is that the. Yeah. So funny story about that. My mom is uh, British and then emigrated to the U S at a, as a 13 year old and then married a Canadian. So by the time she ended up in Canada, she was like, okay, I better get the culture right, you know, (laughs) and she basically looked around and saw that most people knew how to skate. And she thought that if I didn't learn, I would be like kind of a loser, like, you know, you know, people make fun of me or something. So she was pulling me out of dance class on certain nights of the week to do skating. And I was appalled. I just thought, why would you do that to me? Like, I'm going to have a career in dancing. (laughs) Why, why are you doing this to my, my poor body freezing me and so on? Um, And of course, what happened is the coach was like, oh, she's so talented. She can do all this stuff because my dance training was already kind of in effect, I guess. Mm -hmm. And eventually I learned to love it, but it did take me some time because I was kind of um, resentful of this whole pause in my ballerina career that I thought I was going to have. So, right. Yeah. um, I'm that kid. I never played hockey growing up. And uh, so I can technically skate and I'm hoping one day in my life to be able to skate backwards, but. Oh, I will teach you. Okay. Perfect. I can even teach you on Zoom to do it. Really? Okay. Yeah. You might have to do that because, yeah, I don't know how. So that's that's one thing I'm hoping to get to one day in life. And we have lots of ice in Yellowknife uh, for like about 13 months out of 12. We've got ice, yeah. I think. So <laughs> there's lots of opportunity for me to learn how to do it here. I love it. So, yeah. yeah um, so then, um, so I guess from that point of, and, and the other part that's interesting that obviously it's, it's really funny. My dad uh, used to tell me, for instance, I'm a, I'm a judo coach. I've been coaching for 15 years, but when I went to school, I went to school for sound engineering. Oh, cool. Yeah. And so you do that and then you don't do that. Right. Yeah. I don't become a sound engineer. And I thought, what a waste of time and money. And then my dad just said, well, it's always tools that you're just putting in your toolbox and you never know when you might utilize it again. And then years later, I end up getting to commentate the Olympics for CBC and I'm in a studio using microphones. And then Amazing. we end up the Sport North asks me to create a podcast that we're doing as well as uh, the Judo Association that I'm executive director of decide to do that. And all of a sudden I'm using microphones and sort of a stu- and never would have uh, put that together. And so in the same way, um, 
figure skating is a lot of dancing on ice. There's definitely tricks and incredible um, maneuvers that people do, but it's solo dancing. And then you have pair figure skating, which is dancing on ice as well. So it's, it's so um, connected that way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you're right about those skill sets coming in handy later, right? Like I was taking my uh, psychology degree in Toronto at York University and, you know, sitting in classrooms and sort of like furrowed brow, trying to understand that how all the jargon I was learning was actually going to help people, you mm -hmm. know, because my whole point in taking this degree was to help people. And I would go to the rink after and do my, at that point, side hustle, which I had no idea I was really creating a whole career out of, but working with young people and helping them with their choreography. Well, a 12 year old that comes to, to the rink after school, they don't just park their brain, they bring all their problems to the rink. And so right. it, before I could get any kind of artistic stuff out of them, I, it was like, we got to deal with the friends that are being annoying. We got to deal with the boyfriend breakups. We got to deal mm -hmm. with my mom and dad don't understand me. And there it was, it was like, oh, this is preventative psychology. This is a place where I can actually use tools ahead of time and get young athletes to find their own authentic empowerment and deal with things early on in life so that they get on a different trajectory and they don't have to come to therapy at 55. So right. it was a really cool, you know, s switch and flip in my mind of how that tool set should and could be utilized. Right. I guess that leads me to the idea, <clears throat> my own personal struggles at different times in my life. Um, so one is early specialization in sport. I didn't technically specialize early in judo because I always played lots of sports, but I started going to tournaments at five and I went to a lot and then I went to more and then we would travel and I would train on a Saturday. And my, my parents were trying to just be supportive and not understanding the consequence of that. So, you know, at seven and eight years old, I would sometimes do judo for five hours on a Saturday. And yep. what would happen is, is you get to 12 years old and you realize this feels like a job because I've been traveling three hours one way to go to a dojo to train for five hours every Saturday since I was little. And mm -hmm. so I guess the, the effect of that on my, that made me at one point think I was going to quit judo and for whatever reason, my stubbornness or whatever, I didn't. But I guess um, that'd be something that you might touch on a little bit is like why it's important to keep people having a healthy relationship with the sport, even if they show great talent to perform. Mm. That's so rich and so layered. Um, and to your point, there is a risk of it, you know, ending up a, to be a little bit like a job. Um, yeah. How do I want to answer that? I, th I think the first thing I want to say about it is that everyone's journey is unique because everyone is a unique person, but to honor that there are some people that doing a sport recreationally won't be enough. And I was one of those people like, I was really annoyed when I would leave dance class after four hours and I thought we could all stay longer because the, the building could just stay open longer mm -hmm. and let's just dance for two more hours. Like I was quite, you know, frustrated by the fact that I was only dancing 20 hours a week. Right. right. I was that kid and that energy level, my parents honored that, you know, that, okay, I guess she wants to go again or she wants to go longer. And so from the outside, they were getting judgment from their peers going, why are you forcing your kid to do all these dancing and skating things. And they're like, that's not really us. Like she, mm -hmm. she's like, let's go. So I think knowing your child is really, really imperative. And mm -hmm. I always say to parents, you'll know if it's too much or the burnout is there, if their personality starts to change, all of a sudden they're lethargic. They're more grumpy than usual. They want to sleep more. They're like, you know, their, their eating gets all weird. You know, that's when you, you got to check in and see how they're doing personally. But if your kid is like happy go lucky and they're off to practice and you know, the regular ups and downs, but right. just, you know, if they're still them themselves, you know, you're the, the Josh that they, they know, right. then you're, then you're probably in that range of what works for them. Right. Right. Yeah. And I know my own situation is while I say that, and, and I don't mean it's like some, like some horrific life that I led, I love judo. I love, you know, and I yeah. play basketball and soccer and rugby and, and all and volleyball and all these other sports, but there, yeah. and the other thing is to, who's to say that maybe that wasn't just a rut that I, I mean, I got past it. I continued to do judo. I've never gone any period of time in my life. I was allowed on the mats at three and a half. So I have no memory before, and I've done it my whole life. It's like walking to me. So I didn't ever quit. So maybe it's just that, you know, at 12 and 13, it's a funny stage in many people's lives. Um, it's maybe that was just the rut that I had, but there is obviously cases where 
um, too much specialization early and it's especially being pressed upon people that that can have a real negative consequence. So yeah, I guess like reading the child and seeing how motivated they are to go and how excited they still are for it. Um, high performance sport in particular is definitely not for everyone and shouldn't be for everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's a couple of things there as well. I think on the one hand, in order to specialize and become excellent world-class at something, I mean, you're going to have to be off balance. You're going to have to have you know, a lot more time and investment into something than the regular person, because that's mm -hmm. what makes you, you know, a specialist. And then the other side of it is, you know, how people are doing so much with technology these days. To me, I think about technology in the way I'm coaching. So the technology that's most important to me is to, I call it simplify to elevate. How can I get this amount of information and simplify it into like a quantum bite size so that that athlete gets huge results out of possibly less training or, mm -hmm. you know, a training that's very specified. So skating success was born out of the idea of taking, let's say a jump, like an axle that takes probably between eight months and a year and a half to learn on average and condensing that information into an eight hour period so that the athlete has all the information they need. And then they're going through the process. And mm -hmm. it was an incredible innovation, but it was about thinking of coaching as a technology and evolving it so that maybe we don't have to have the hours of repetition um, stack up to burnout, but they can be really focused, really intentional. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> when I, when I think about uh, coaching from kids to teenagers, the one thing that I always think about, so in judo, we have um, GTAC QA, which is maximum. Um, it's like maximum efficiency. And so mm -hmm. I think about efficiency in, um, in terms of not just our time, like you only have so much energy that a, a child can utilize before they're exhausted for the day. Then they have life or teenager or adult. They only have, they have so many hours a day that they're available. And then there's only so much energy that can be utilized during that period of time. So being yeah. as efficient with that time as possible is necessary because no matter what, even if your gym could be 24 seven, that's still only 24 seven. And then of that, you only have access to people so much. So yeah, that's one thing that I, I think about, like, you could have someone involved six hours a day, but it can't be six hours a day of sprinting. Exactly. So how, so how much of that is um, video review or, or different things like that, um, to get that, that process together? Um, yeah, you, you can't just run forever. So I guess, in, in that regard, do you show people in person, having them performing the technique, or are you often introducing them to the specifics of how to perform a technique, like say an axle, which I think is one and a half rotations. I'm not sure. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, I think, or it might be which foot you jump yes, off. You'll know more you than me. It. Oh, perfect. Um, is, yeah. is, is, is it showing them in a classroom setting and then showing them technically or showing them technically reviewing it in a sort of a classroom or video review session? How do you do that? Yeah, the specifics of how we teach an axle or a spin or anything like that is, is interesting because it can be a lot of different ways. And there are two pieces that I do consistently with athletes. And the first piece is setting a context for them to learn. So my favorite coaching thing I've ever come across, and I don't remember who it is that said it. Um, so it's anonymous in my mind, but it's, I don't care how much you know until I know how much you care. And that's how kids operate, right? That's how we all operate. Once you, I know that you care about my outcome and you care about who I am, then I'll actually buy into what you're saying. And now I can get to the information. So right. setting that context is literally the most important piece of what I do with any client. Then the secondary thing to your point, do I show them? Do I, you know, do this on the computer? Or do I do it in person? That is actually often based on that individual's learning style. So getting them to understand how they learn and learn that as a skill set. Mm -hmm. And are they more visual? Are they more tactile? Are they auditory? And then drawing that forward from them, it's like the super highway of learning, I find. Because if I can get that sense of what, A, they're going to know that I care, and B, they're going to be receiving the information in their own format, now we are really rolling and we can get somewhere pretty efficiently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the building of the trust when you put it that way, like that's, as, as people that have coached a long time, 
when you look back at an athlete's career that you've worked with, often what you cherish is the bond that was created with the athlete. Much like when you were an athlete, what you often cherish isn't the top of the podium. It's the bond that you had with your coach and often your fellow athletes or even competitors at one time. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that, yeah, to be like my standard is I want to create this trust between us so that they truly know that I'm looking out for their best interest and everything comes from that place. It just sounds like uh, like incredibly healthy and I've never thought of it exactly that way before. So I'm so glad. I'm so glad to share that with you. It's 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 the thing that has helped me the most because you know, in coaching there's a lot of pressure. Mm-hmm. You know, you're in in my specific realm and what I do in choreography, I'm I'm like an artist that's doing my work in public and there's kind of like a gun to your head. It's like, you have to get this done. Like, there's no, like, Mm -hmm. you know, the routine has to be handled in that amount of time. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, if I fly across the country, it's like, you have three days, it's got to happen. It's got to, and often I'll meet the client for the first time. And it's like, we've got to get to this intimate place of art together in a really short time. So if I don't have mechanisms to gain trust and basically put my ego aside, we don't, we don't get that result. And so I've, right. I've really studied that part of it, mainly as a survival in the, in the industry. This episode is brought to you by Table Tennis North. They work diligently to connect kids to the beautiful sport of table tennis, regularly going out of their way to teach these skills virtually or in person throughout the territory. Please check out what they're up to by clicking the link below. Bonus, you're right. It creates amazing relationships. Right. And so with the role that you're in of working with international athletes. So I guess my question would be when you're working with someone that you're not super, um, you don't have a long history with. So you go and you meet this athlete. So how does that go to that place? Like there's for people that haven't watched a lot of figure skating, they're incredible athletes doing these jumps and flips and spins at a rate that I could not handle. I don't know what the G forces are, uh, but it would be way too much for me. And then there's a musical component and a dancing component. Um, So I guess like, where does that start? Do you go there with an idea of what you want to do? Or do you go, oh, this is the type of thing that they're into musically and what, how they're like, how does, how does that go? Mm -hmm. Well, it's pretty cool that you mentioned like the sort of technical prowess Mm -hmm. of skating. So to give you a context, when somebody does a quadruple jump that you see on TV, the RPM is 400 of the body. Wow. So that Crazy. kind of gives you a sense of like the, the kind of, yeah, the, the kinds of parameters you have to become if you want to do that. But great question. I love this question about artistic intentionality and the difference of humans. So one of the things that's very, very cool. And, and when I tell you this, it's going to, you're going to think about it again later, which is really fun okay. and maybe even take it into your own coaching. So every human has a personal rhythm of movement and you know this because if i take you on a little adventure all right if you're at home with somebody that you know really well a family member and you're sitting in another room and you cannot see them at all but you hear them coming Mm -hmm. you know who it is right by their steps and yes you already know who it is and when i watch someone skate that's what i'm seeing i'm seeing their natural rhythm and movement style so I'm actually adapting as the choreographer and the artist to their art and how they naturally move and trying to give them a sense of power through that and then adapt that to their routine so that basically there's no way for them to go wrong. There's no wrong step because Mm -hmm. they're in their own movement style, in their uniqueness. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the part that's tricky is getting people on board. So I'll give you a, uh, a quick example from a couple of weeks ago. I was working with a young male. He's 13. He's just going through that growth. He's like, I'm too cool for school. You know, this guy. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I have an hour with this kid. How the heck do I meet him and gain his trust and then try to make him like do artistic stuff on top of it. And so I decided to take my energy and, and lower my energy in a really flat way so that he could kind of rise up. And so I took my skates off. I sat down on the side of the boards and I looked up at him so that he was literally like taller and stronger than me. And I said directly to him, I said, listen, I have lots of stuff to share with you if you want, but I'm aware that at your age and your stage of the game, it's probably like Fort Knox to get inside your brain. You're probably, you probably have like, you know, 
a really strong uh, thing protecting your, your brain and even your heart. Mm -hmm. So you have to decide how much you want to let me in so that I can get to know you enough to give you movement that matches your heart and what you want to do. And so offering it like that and like basically knocking at the door, right? Mm -hmm. Knock, knock. Are you, are you going to allow me in? Right. And when I, when I posed it to him that way, it's like, he like, you know, he creeped the door open a little bit. Okay. Maybe. And then right. by the end of the session, the door had blown wide open and we were dancing and skating together and laughing and, and joking. Right. And it's, so it's about that, that understanding, watching them who they are naturally and then kind of asking permission. Can I come in to your world? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's an interesting sport because I grew up, my oldest sister did it. My mom used to love watching it. So Brian yeah. Orser and, and um, Kurt Browning and, and people like that. I remember watching them growing up and it's interesting because you have this incredible trick component in the middle of a, um, a musical interaction type of thing. And so when you're, I guess the, the level of the tricks is dependent on the, the age and the, and the level that they're competing at. So you would, would, so the next stage would be, would you create the movement that you want and then fit the tricks at the appropriate times and what those levels of those tricks are, or are they built into as you choreograph the entirety of it? Like, is it, do you separate it into sections or is it sort of built as you go? Um, I think every choreographer is different on that. Some people like to do a lot of pre-planning and then map out where those elements are going to go. And they, they listen to the music kind of ferociously and all that. Um, I do it really organically. I've got to be honest. It's, a, it's basically a channeling, <laughs> you know, I, I channel with the skaters movement and I do have a context in my head of everything that needs to go in the routine. And I, right. I write that down on the side so that I come back and double check myself, but it has to organically flow mm -hmm. so that those elements, those difficult tricks to your point are in the best possible scenario. They, they feel organic to have them in that moment of the music and that moment in time and space on the ice. Mm -hmm. And so it's like thinking in three dimension and feeling, feeling into art that moves right right so if something for example i always tell the athlete if you feel awkward it looks awkward right, right. so what we have to do is get that movement to feel like it flows okay. and all of skating and this this might be new to you just because it's not your primary sport but all of skating is on circles so everything's on a lean and taking your understanding of like a 90 degree angle so if i wanted to go towards you but we were on the ice i would actually have to take a 90 degree turn and then get to you that's actually the fastest way. And so understanding huh. the mechanics and the math behind the skating and building right. that in, but only explaining what needs to happen for that athlete. Right. It, it just gives me this place where I can create movement that will feel organic to them and, and support their ability to perform. <clears throat> to that point, if someone is early in their development, I don't know how early people usually start. When does someone usually start technically figure skating? I guess that could be at a very young age four, yeah, five, it, six. Yeah, yeah, totally. It can be four, five, six. Um, and then a lot of people start later. Um, right. so it's, but it, it can start basically once you can skate forwards and backwards, I know you're going to work on that, right. uh, forwards, backwards, stop, turn around, do crossovers. Then you can move into learning, you know, the basics of figure skating and build from there. Right. And so, um, if someone is getting involved in figure skating, what would you say, like, you have a child that's heavily motivated to do it and they love it and they think it's really fun. So what would your feedback be for, to help them down that road? If they're early on, like, let's say it's an eight year old, they've done a bit of figure skating. They're not highly competitive because they're eight or nine years old, but what would you say would be their a nice way to get the ball continuing to roll in terms of skill development or just being super comfortable on the ice, like where would you guide them to first start to hone which skills, I guess I would say. Mm. I think, you know, it's funny, but I, I ended up with this benefit accidentally because I started in ballet and then ended up into the world of figure skating. 
And so I had a lot of hours into being a ballerina by the time I was doing competitions in figure skating, let's say. Mm-hmm. So at the time I had no idea of the, of the benefits. So until I went to go train athletes myself, that's when I saw the gap that was missing. And the gap there is body awareness and full body ability to move. And I'm talking range of movement, right? So as a ballerina, you work with small muscles, you you do precision movement and you repeat it and you practice it over and over and over. You work on flexibility and lots of range of movement. And so when I got to the ice, I was always so confused. How come someone can't just glide? Well, they actually don't have that muscular awareness, that body awareness to hold themselves, to just maybe put their hip in front by an inch or Mm -hmm. to lift their body. And that was all built in for me. So, you know, if somebody really, really wants a foundation for their athlete, maybe it's not ballet, but it's some type of dance movement where you have to actually use your body as the instrument and you have to learn how it moves, how it looks when it moves and be able to kind of command that with a range of movement. So especially as people head into puberty and you'll know it because a lot of adults, right? They've lost almost all range of movement. They don't even reach with their arm up on a shelf. They get on something and they go like this, Mm -hmm. right? Right. And I'm sorry for those listening. I'm like joking around that I'm up on a shelf and like barely, barely reaching up to get your hand. Right. Yeah. So range of movement. And I actually give this advice to people who are older than me that want to learn. They'll see me working out or something like, well, how are you doing this movement? And I will say to them. If you want to be healthier, you know, move your joints in circular motion, like stretch your range of motion again, see what you can do for range of of movement, because then the blood flow happens. And in a skating sense, then the art starts to kick in as well. Yeah. Range of motion, sort of like muscular development in general. It's like, if you don't use it, you lose it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. It's really big. The, The other sport that I would connect heavily to figure skating as well is um, gymnastics. You know, you look at the floor routine of gymnastics and you see that similar component. You have tricks with music, with a dance component. Is there a number of athletes that transition? Do they transition either way? Do you ever see that? I mean, they're also world-class athletes too. So they're capable of incredible physical feats. From my experience, it's super rare. It's not an interestingly, it should be, Right. it shouldn't be, but you know, I think that all, although there are similarities, it's identity wise. I think people that love gymnastics, they love gymnastics, right? And then right. figure skaters, like if you tell figure skaters often to go to a ballet class, they're like, I'm not a ballerina. I don't want to do that. You know, right. you have to kind of weave it into their identity on the sport. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I play with that all the time. I mean, I let, we do like plies with Drake music. You know what I mean? Like, it's right. just like, you know, it's, yeah. I just like, we're doing the, we're, we're doing working out with, we're, you know, playing the, you know, the weekend and it's, they have no idea they're doing ballet. Right. I just rename right. everything, <clears throat> but it, it's like an identity and people that are, I mean, figure skaters are a little bit similar to gymnasts in this, this, I think there's a daredevil component that isn't quite sane. Like, mm-hmm. you know, like really when you break it down, figure skating is like, okay, I have a slippery surface. And it's really cold. And I want you to put a sword on your foot. And then I want you to try to jump in the air and land. Oh, don't worry. Don't wear wear any kind of padding or support or no, no, that's not cool. Just, just throw yourself and try it. And then the surface is like concrete too. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. (laughs) Like it doesn't make sense, right? Like when you're logistical. Um, And actually I think that plays into more of the early maturation in the sport than anything, because as people come, come into the sport later on, they're always afraid to fall. Mm-hmm. And you, you cannot learn to figure skate without falling. So I think that's why young kids are actually better at learning it younger. It's a big, I don't know if I answered your question though. <laughs> uh, well, you did. It was, it was, I was just, the, the main thing I was curious about is I just see such a, as a non-gymnast, non-figure skater, non, is there a, is ballerina unisex or is there another term? Yeah. Uh, ballet dancer. Yeah. Okay. So I'm none of those. Yeah. Uh, but there's just such a natural connection to all three of them that I just, that I was, I was curious how much, how much transition there is between them because they seem so natural in the same yeah. sense though, people watch UFC and they know that I'm a judoka and they're like, Oh, you must watch that. And I'm like, no, I'm just a judo bum. Like, I just like yeah. judo. Yeah. Like I have no interest in being punched or punching someone in the face. Um, for yeah, those that don't know, thing. there's no striking in judo. Um, 
But the other part that you brought up is one of my my two real passions in terms of judo is high performance. It is because it I feel like such a challenge. It's so challenging to help people get to such an extreme level of performance that it challenges you in creative ways, even in something that's not necessarily creative in this artistic sense. You have to be creative to help that person continue to improve after they've done something 20 years is a beautiful challenge. Um, the other end of the spectrum that I'm super passionate about is learning how to fall. It's such oh. an important skill. Yes. Um, I recently read some information on the CDC that's mind boggling. So they estimated in 2015, it was $50 billion in the United States alone in hospital bills from injuries. They estimate that in the year 2030, seven Americans will die an hour from falling. An hour, seven and what? Hour. Yeah. Yeah. It's real crazy. Um, crazy. And then it's like 95% of hip fractures are from people not knowing how to fall. The vast majority of head injuries are from people not knowing how to fall. People wow. that fall and get injured are far less likely to continue on in sport or be as active or go to the grocery store. 800. What was the number? It was like, uh, 800,000 people a year are hospitalized from an injury, 300,000 of which are elderly, which isn't, ex which isn't unexpected. But that means 500,000 people a year that aren't of the elderly are hospitalized in the United States in one year alone. And so- It breaks um, my heart. <laughs> yeah, it's, cr it's crazy. My own mother never did judo and she fell and broke her hip when she was about 64 years old. So it's like connect, and it, to the same point, I've fallen countless times and for the most part, I'm doing pretty good. So yeah. I, um, yeah, so I guess that's a, a huge component, like knowing you're going to fall. Um, I don't know how much you train, there must be something, but how much you train people to learn how to fall safely. Like I always think judo has a monopoly on falling because we throw <laughs> each other a lot. So we yeah. do it a lot, yeah. but obviously learning how to fall safely on ice, um, must be trained in some way. Yeah. I mean the, the best part about ice is you can you can go with it you can go with the flow of it so it's learning to harness the ability to as you touch down to relax enough that you, the ice can can take you mm -hmm. you know it's when people are very tense yeah. and to your point when people don't know how to fall they're very tense and then it makes you brittle mm -hmm. and you hit something and it just like it's like anything the reverb is not there mm -hmm. so I always say, for example, um, my analogy with athletes is, okay, I have a basketball and I have a teapot. Now, both are very strong, okay? The basketball is super strong. You can throw it against the wall, you whatever, no problem, right? And the teapot is also strong. It has really hot boiling water in it. It can hold it for a long time. It's strong. It can last a long time. But if you drop both of those, which one is going to break, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's, we want to be the basketball. We want to be relaxed enough and enough sort of stretch in our ability to flow with the bounce mm -hmm. that we go with that flow. And it's, it's, you're right. It's a trained event. And fortunately in skating, like I said, with the, um, the circles, you know, you can really allow yourself to fall and get up. I even have a fun maneuver where I do it on purpose, like go full speed and fall and slide and get up just to show them you can really, you know, go with the flow of the ice. So, right. Yeah. The, um, lacking rigidity or being able to be calm enough to not be rigid when you fall is so important. Like I always tell people, you know, if you're falling straight forward and you stick your arm out to land on it, your body weight landing on a small joint is the video that you don't want to watch. Yeah. It's yeah. not, not fun. Um, yeah. yeah. So it's like, you have to do it enough that you feel confident that it becomes a subconscious act so that you, yeah. fear doesn't take over and you don't act in a in a way that you might not know is not for your best interest. Okay. But funny story about falling really quick. Okay. Yeah. Um, of course. I took it too far because I learned a different sport at it as an adult. So when I was 25, I was like, I'm going to take up tennis because tennis could be like a lifelong sport and da da da. Right, right? Right, right. And I'm in my lesson with my coach. And of course my hand-eye coordination, having never been trained in my whole life was very poor. So he would like serve the ball to me and I would miss the ball, but mm -hmm. my body went, oh, well, we missed. So I would fall down No, <laughs> on the court. I like miss and fall like straight up. Right. And eventually he started getting red and he was like, he gave me the tennis finger, which is just the come here to the, right. to the net. I need to talk to you. Right. You know, and I, I was so eager. I was like, I run up to my coach. Like what, what, what? He goes, 
there's no falling in tennis. There's just, there's no falling in tennis. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, look at those ladies. And there were these, you know, more aged ladies having their quartet of tennis and they were dying laughing at me. They're just like, look at this girl. What is she doing? Falling all over the tennis court. He's like, stop right. it you're embarrassing me and anyway so it's you have to be sport specific falling <laughs> right yeah it's it sort of reminds me to a degree when you're a kid and you're playing catch with your friend and you want the catch to be spectacular so you're like throw it a little bit in front of me so I can make a diving catch you know <laughs> so every time you catch the ball you're like ah and then you'll catch it and then fall down as if yeah. you jumped for it like you want to be the center so, fielder of the Toronto Blue Jays and it's totally unnecessary and it looks yeah. ridiculous <laughs> Grass stains so I can only imagine an adult an athletic <laughs> adult playing tennis and like corkscrewing onto the ground every time they miss the ball it oh, would yeah. probably be fantastic to see I should have had a TikTok back then I would have been you know yeah, viral. You'd be super famous <laughs> super famous. yeah everybody would be doing it yeah man put it to some song <clears throat> so um yeah I, I guess the the next thing that I was I was curious about is um confidence is such a fickle interesting thing necessary component in performance and so first we understand is when when an athlete trusts their coach there's a confidence that naturally occurs from that because they believe that that coach is helping them and so they will improve but um, what other things do you find helps to build the confidence in an athlete that you're working with Mm, I love this question I'm so glad you are taking it this direction because I think that that is the point of sport. Like we have sport as a place to learn confidence, which is trust yourself that no matter what you're up against, you will figure it out. That's what it is, Mm -hmm. right? Confidence comes from, okay, if I feel the worst feeling in the world, I trust myself to be able to deal with that feeling and move through it. If I lose in front of everybody, I can trust myself that I will get up and take my bow and get Mm -hmm. off the ice and still have my own back. And that's all we're really doing for the amount of time someone is doing their sport. We're Mm -hmm. building that with them and reminding them that they can figure it out. They will get through this next thing. And they're gonna basically build their confidence muscles through those pieces of adversity, which I think that's the only real point of sport. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had um, a conversation with Paul Jordan. He played professionally volleyball uh, in Europe for 14 years, was on the national team for 15 years and is a Volleyball Canada Hall of Famer and as good a career as you can have in volleyball. And we were talking about the end of the career. Um, And the part that's interesting to me is what I learned doing judo my whole life is that it's so difficult. The trying to achieve these incredible goals is so difficult and you're humbled so often that other aspects of life at times can seem not monotonous, but they become less of a mountain because you're like, okay, this test is hard, but you know, trying to defeat this person at this event was really hard. hard. So (laughs) if I put some of this work in, I should be okay. Yeah. And, and the other part that the negative side of it was we're often so tied to the, to the identity of being this athlete in this specific realm that when we leave it, it is a very, uh, it's a, it can be very brutal. It can be really brutal to, to navigate life after, but then again, where it may come back to help us, it may be cr- helped create this difficult situation, but it also helps solve it is you can feel like, I don't know where my life's going. I don't know what I'm doing. Cause I'm not that athlete anymore. I'm not the person that they know of as the judo person, but because we've had so many challenges and worked through them our whole lives, that at some point for me is that at some point you realize, well, that's just a challenge again. It's just a challenge to find that again. And all we've done our whole lives in athletics is challenge ourselves. So this is just the new one. Yeah. It's so beautiful. And you're, what you're bringing up on, on, in that point around life after sport is so great for anyone listening. So I'm really grateful that you're talking about it openly. Uh, My business partner, Stephanie Hanlon is literally the coach for this. She teaches life after sport and works with Olympic level athletes, NHL athletes, business people, and does exactly the work to help prepare them for who they are going to become in their new pieces of identity. Mm-hmm. And it's, I've seen the work from the inside, so I know how powerful it can be. And when I faced it myself was actually a kind of a weird scenario where 
I had been doing choreography for years, running my business, all the things. And I just felt like, you know, strong and powerful. And then I broke my foot and faced the, the power of being humbled, right? Brought to your knees, like, okay, how are you going to choreograph now? It's the beginning mm-hmm. of the season. And I just had to surrender to, all right, what is my identity when I'm not able to push myself and skate for 10 hours straight, or I'm not able to show up and have all the energy because the healing was taking 12 hours of sleep a night. And what I realized through that, which was ended up being an incredible experience was, oh, what I'm bringing is way more valuable than just my ability to show how I skate or just my ability Mm -hmm. to perform. It's like my energy and my intention and my connection with the other person is incredible. And that's where I was really honed in and realigned, let's say, (laughs) spiritually Mm -hmm. realigned with the Mm -hmm. purpose of what I do. And ironically, (laughs) two or three years later, oh, oops, we have to do it all on Zoom. Oh, well, I've done that before, sitting still and doing choreography. And all of a sudden I have a whole new realm for my business because I can do all of this online from this chair. So it's, you don't know the gifts of going through the work And that's really the gift of sport. And I think to your point, life after and through the identity of sport, it can become another layer of your confidence. Yeah. And, and the other part, I guess, to be um, an olive branch is I think people often feel if you don't have close friends or whatever, everyone feels uh, lonely or isolated in a sense, when you're going through a struggle, it feels like it's just you and that other people might not feel that struggle. And my experience from my friends and people that I've met and had the opportunity to meet and hear stories of and people like Adam Vancouverden, who talks about post-Olympic depression, who was an Olympic champion rower for Canada, is that it doesn't matter if you achieved all of your goals, some of your goals, or you were dramatically short of your goals. If you chased something so passionately, the same thing can happen to everyone because I was not an Olympic athlete. I didn't get close to the goals that I had set for myself as an athlete. And that doesn't matter because at the end, when I stopped, I still felt the same as, you know, some NHL hockey players do when they retire and they might've been the best hockey player in the world. They're still searching for their, their identity post the NHL career that you're so tied to it. You've done it your whole life. Like when people talk about the Olympic cycle and they say, Oh, they've trained for this for four years. I always laugh. Find me the athlete that trained for something for four (laughs) years and made it to the Olympics. Yeah, yeah. Everyone got involved at a young age. Maybe it wasn't even that sport, but everybody was involved chasing this for a long time to make it to the Olympic level. This is not a four-year cycle. It's four years between the games. Sorry, yeah. Yeah. Um, In figure skating too, that in that moment of the four-year cycle culminating, when you take off into the air on that jump, you have to get into your position in 0.2 of a second. So you have 20% of a second to get your body to do the thing that you trained your whole life for. And if you miss that point too, you likely miss the podium. Right. And can't fall at the Olympics, like and right. get on the podium. Yeah. And the and the thing that's wild, the connection, I guess, to judo and and uh figure skating that I think similarly is that way is when you lose in judo, you're literally picking yourself up off the ground. Yeah. When you fall in figure skating, you're it's it's there's something to, um, like, as everyone's, most people are aware, uh, your physiological positioning and your, your psychological or your, your mental attitude in a moment are so connected. So when you lose and you're picking yourself off of the ground, it feels really hard. It's like, yeah. it's really tough. And when just like, you know, when someone walks into a meeting and they walk in with their chest pumped out and their shoulders back and they have great posture and they walk into the room, they look confident. They also yeah. feel confident from that position. When yeah. you lose and you're literally on the ground, you feel like that. Yeah. It's, it's a flattening of the ego. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's as humble as you can be. You're, you're down. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. I guess that leads me to uh, the, the idea. Like I, I like to give the reference to my athletes when they're walking to the mats is everything that you do when you're entering this, you're about to perform. It doesn't matter the sport. It's not just that you have to physically do something. It's a performance as well. You have to exude confidence to your opponent or to the judges or to whoever it is. But when you walk to that 
creating confidence is connected uh, physically. So the, the reference that I like to give is if I was to offer you a million dollars cash, although that's not very much money in nowadays. So if I was yeah. to offer you, if I was to offer you some Elon Musk money, a couple okay. billion dollars. And I said, all that I need you to do is give me genuine tears. Most people's first thing that they do, hunch their back, lean their head over. They first put themselves in a physical position to cry. Yeah. Then they picture something that's horrific or that has happened or make something up in their head to try to create that emotion. But the first action is a physical one. And so if you're going to be confident as an athlete, your first action has to be to show that you're physically confident. It's not just here. Like those two things are very connected. Wow. What a, what a beautiful way to explain it to your athletes. Um, it reminds me, I had a routine with a young girl and we decided she was in her very broody teenage time right and so i said well what do you want to express and she's like well something dark something mm -hmm. you know and, I, and so we actually choreographed an, and and a piece where she was at a funeral and she was going to portray the fact that she didn't know who was in the casket until she saw that it was in her mind her father or something like this right mm -hmm. and she she totally agreed to this she wanted she wanted to do this like it was like mm -hmm. very artistically deep for her Right. And I said to her one practice, I said, this would be so much better if you were actually crying by the end of the performance. Hmm. And she said, I'm in, I'm doing it. So she started practicing exactly what you're talking about, doing her body, doing all the things. <laughs> and I had to get out of the way. And when, when she would go to perform it, we did a, a, about a 20 minute window where mm -hmm. that was her, her process. She would pace around in the, the waiting room and literally get herself ready to cry and she would produce tears by the end of that performance wow. on cue. And like, wow. and my only job was when she come off to make her laugh, you know, bring it back and right, right. reconnect. But she was so committed to this idea. And I just thought it was beautiful because she, she was then in total confident control of her ability and her performance. I thought it was mm -hmm. really, really neat. Did she get into acting later? Or do we now know her as Scarlett Johansson or? Uh, yeah, I don't know, but I have another girl who I always said was an actor and she, we, that was another crying thing that she want, we wanted to do. She could do all these different things and yeah, she is in acting now. So I think that right. there's definitely a component of it. Yeah. 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 I, I, I always find that connection so fascinating. I don't remember when it came to me to, to try to utilize it to my athletes more. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I'm always trying to find ways to help them be confident because, you know, our body is a puppet to our mind. And so if yeah. this thing's not ready to work and ready to be confident and for you to truly believe you can do it, it doesn't matter what you're physically capable of if you're not mentally prepared. Yeah. 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 Um, and then I guess the next thing is, is because you were talking about um, her preparing in this emotional way to do something emotional is do you often help athletes to create their their preparation in terms of performance on the day of on the um, moments leading up to it I think that's something that sometimes is overlooked by some people is that they go oh okay cool yeah I do this I train all the time I'm really good so on Saturday when I go to do my competition <laughs> I just go and perform and I think sometimes it's undervalued creating your pattern or your preparation that this is what you do all the time. So you have your, your way of doing it and everyone's going to be individual, but do you often help athletes with that part of the process? Yeah, it's, I absolutely do. So to kind of circle it back to the beginning and how I got involved, because I really didn't think I would ever do coaching. I, I thought I was done with the sport. Like I was, I was one of those, I was like, okay, put my skates in the closet and go to university. Um, but when I found that, oh, the interest I had in helping people and basically what I call authentic empowerment for others, right? That lined up so well with the sport that I realized, oh, this skill set matches that skill set. And that's when I realized I'm a personal performance coach and a choreographer. And all of the things I do line up with that. And I, you know, people have said to me, well, you know, maybe you should just split it off. So this is when you're doing choreography and this is when you're doing mental performance coaching. And I'm like, well, I can, I can't really split the, the yin and the yang, right? Because to mm -hmm. your point, how do you show up and emotionally show your heart to an audience without being mentally prepared and present? It's impossible. So mm -hmm. to me, it's a, it's a connected thing. And the athletes that I serve are, they really know that, you know, they kind of joke about it. Like Jadine's going to make sure you're, you're doing well as a person first, athlete second and results third. So that's how we go through the process. And it's a daily practice. And then we build it in towards competition. And I always 
folded into their language and their awareness in layers. Um, like one really good example is I had a young athlete, she made like an, a, a, a games team, like an Alberta games kind of thing, right? So she's going to be going as a young kid with a different coach and no parents and all that on a team. And so for probably about six weeks beforehand, every week it was like, okay, if this happens, this is how you deal with it. If this happens, this is how you deal with it. And we even got to the point where we practiced what would happen if nobody told her the schedule and she didn't even get the on ice warm up. You know, she had to just run in and hit the ice, take one minute and then skate her performance. Right. And basically by the end of all these funny things, she was so prepared. She was like rolling her eyes at me. Like, are you kidding me? But right. she came back from the event and went, yeah, they could have thrown anything at me. I was ready. So yeah, right. I always like to fold those things into, into coaching. Right. And if you, if you've ever felt unprepared for a test, which probably everyone ever has is yeah. you may even know the material but the anxiety that's created from feeling unprepared is like handcuffs. Yeah. You can't access the information. So just feeling like the you're ready for the challenge and any challenge that it is and having this routine and the routine can be short, brief, long, whatever it is, but just knowing I have in my back pocket, I have this routine. When I'm finished this routine, that routine might be what you eat for breakfast. That could be a part of it. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, which, which I always find is important. Like as we talked earlier about food, we both have such a strong appreciation for it. Yeah, is um, yeah. is finding finding the food. It, all of those things lead to you feeling like it's just another day. And I I really like the idea as a baseball fan. Part of the reason baseball players can do such amazing things is because they play 162 games and they play five to six days in a week. So if yeah. they have a really bad game, well tomorrow's just another game because they play again the next day and the next day. So when when we you know, you can talk about putting people on a pedestal, but putting competitions on a pedestal, all that that does is make you feel overwhelmed in the moment. So making, um, we would, I would often go through a practice of, of making, making my athletes feel like every Saturday is a tournament day. So when it becomes mm. a tournament day, it's Saturday. That's yeah. what we do every Saturday. Yeah. So they would and create it's part that of tournament your... routine. I love that. I love that. Actually, baseball, one, one of my favorite sports to watch because I just find it so relaxing is one of my favorite analogies for sport in general. So figure skaters are always trying to land the jump every single time in the performance and kids get really hard on themselves. Oh, I missed my jump. I didn't do my clean thing. And I say to them, okay, well in baseball, a really good batting average is like 350. Like oh, that's, that's a, like, yeah, you're real good. Like you are really good. Yeah, and I, they go, what does that mean? And I say, that means you get paid millions of dollars to hit the ball three out of 10 times. Yeah. They're like, what? I'm like, no, actually less than 50%. If you got a less than 50% in school, how would you feel about that? You wouldn't get paid millions of dollars, but that's how hard it is to be that good. So when you expect yourself to land your jump 10 out of 10 times, you're not being realistic with mm -hmm. what the actual thing is you're being asked to do. So I always give them that little bit of reference point of you're, if you're a million gazillionaire pitcher, when you get up to bat and you hit the ball three out of 10 times, your coach is like, I got the best guy in the league. Right. Mm -hmm. So, right. Yeah. Setting expectations. I think about it. Uh, I often make this reference when I'm talking to my friends about movies is expectations are the killer. <clears throat> ah! so when I, when I watched the matrix two, my life was crushed because I watched the matrix one and it's one of my favorite movies ever. Totally. So when you, when you have people with unrealistic expectations of how they should perform, they are setting themselves up to beat themselves up mentally for this lack of performance. No one in baseball history has ever batted anywhere near 500 for a season. That would be the greatest player ever. And that means more than half the time they lose in yeah. judo at the international scene to the same extent, the average success rate at the world and Olympic level um, and grand slam grand prix level is 10 and a half percent success rate of a throw. Wow. So 90% of your attacks will be unsuccessful in judo. 90%. Hey, this is so good. We should have like a, you and I should do like a little stats, sport stat thing on the side sometime and just throw these things out there and share it with all the athletes we know because come yeah. on. Yeah, that's crazy. 10%. And that's not to say that people aren't better or worse. So there's one judoka from J Japan who's a total freak. His success rate of techniques at an Olympic Games once was like 39%. But but a Canadian named Jessica Klimkate, first ever Canadian to medal at the Olympics as a woman in judo, also a world champion, second ever world champion from Canada. Her success rate of her throws at the international level is six and a half percent. She's a world Whoa. champion and an Olympic medalist and 
yeah. as good as anyone on the tour and her success rate six and a half percent. And that doesn't mean her technique's bad or anything like that, but it, it, there's many reasons for that, but it just shows like to think that every time you attack, you're going to throw somebody or every time you jump, you're going to land it. You're just yeah. setting yourself up for, for disappointment. Cause that's not, that's not going to happen. So, so know that that's okay. You can still yeah. be the best in the world. She's a world champion. People give up so much more easily than they need to, if they want to get success at anything. And I think that's the whole, again, talking earlier, the whole point of sport, you know, like the 12 year old who goes out there to do a figure skating competition and falls on her face in front of the whole rink. And nowadays all the results, every like detail of her results is not only online and available for everybody, but usually the video is too. It's completely transparent. Mm -hmm. So I always say to their parents, you know, well, I'm spending a lot of money on this and I'm like, yeah. So when your daughter's 20 and she goes for a job interview, her first thought is, yeah, at least I'm wearing pants. Right. Like at least I'm not half naked and falling in front of me. Like I, these are real, real things. Right. And the toughest people I've <laughs> ever met are these young figure skaters. It's just like they have faced this adversity, this falling, this, this ability to face challenge in public so many times that by the time they do those other things in life, it's like, yeah, I got this. Right. Yeah. It, it, yeah. I think that's a, a universal for sport. You push yourself in ways that you didn't think were possible and the challenges of everyday life while not mundane are achievable you can you can conquer those challenges and you know that you can because you've done you've done it so many times before yeah. and i think some things some of the impossible things that we do as people we often do them so young that we forget we mm -hmm. forget that we learned a language and started to speak to people we forget that we learned how to walk without anyone giving us a course or having an instructor. We just do it. That's seemingly impossible. I'm trying to learn French now as an adult, and it's very difficult, but we did that as infants. You know, we learned to communicate in, in so many different ways. We learned to walk and um, sport is sort of like a reminder that you can push yourself in those ways. We're capable of so much more than we think. We just, we're ready to hit the eject button sometimes and and, um, and sport can show us that we can do otherwise, which is, which is pretty wild. The other, the other thing that's more commonly spoken about or more commonly noticeable, I guess, is distraction, I think, in modern life. And so do you find it difficult? Is it different now? Or do you find because the majority of the people that you work with are so passionate that they are present in the moment of what they're doing for the most part? Okay, so ironic, because as you said the word distraction, I'm realizing my next meeting is going to start, so I'm going to text them, so pause okay. this recording. Sure. Often in, in life now, our regular 22 life, 2022, distraction has an effect, but you don't see it right away, and so people, they'll continue to be distracted for a long time before they realize, oh, no, I've been on Instagram for an hour and a half, right? right. But in skating... If you're distracted, when you go up on the air, you will fall and hit, hurt yourself. Like mm -hmm. it's like very quick feedback. Right. So that's again, the discipline and the practice of the sport. I mean, when you get on ice with a blade, you can just fall on your face on your topics. If, even if you know how to skate, if you're distracted mm -hmm. and, you're, and, you're, and you're not being aware of the skating, funny things happen. And so that's one of my favorite things about it. To your point, it's like distraction is so prevalent, but I feel like figure skating brings you back right now or judo. Someone's going to come after you. Well, if you're not paying attention, you're hey, <laughs> hey, you're vulnerable. So I think that's another beautiful side effect about conditioning the mind around presence because you don't really have a choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then what I found now is I rarely practice the sport of, that I love because I'm coaching it all the time. It's probably similar for yourself is I rarely do it. So then I, I'm present in coaching but then I'm not present in a physical, physical activity for myself necessarily. So then it's sort of finding things that I have now to, to make me present in the moment. And as a working professional, leaving your work at work, no matter how passionate, no matter how much in love with the work you are, you can't carry it around with you all the time. So when I go home, it's very easy for me and my brain to think about how I can make this one kid better and this other 
grant that I have to do and this school that I'm talking to about putting judo in the, in the school system, that, that goes home with me really easily. So what I found now, which is also part of our, again, it always comes back to food with me, but <laughs> is that going home and being like, I want to make something good to eat. I want to make something that challenges me and is fun means that I can't be thinking about my work when I'm at home, because if I am, then I'm going to burn what I'm making, or I'm not going to prepare it properly. And it's not going to turn out. Okay. So um, it's like, I guess maybe I got to that, I, that place from remembering how sport made me present, but how that's such an important thing to plug back into now for me, for my life to not let that bother me. Cause I, I you can't think about work, even if it's the best thing ever, you can't think about it 24 seven. Absolutely. I think also it's a, it's a respect thing. So I work with an athlete, I'm teaching them something. And then they ask me, well, do you think about my program when you go home at night? And I say, never, I never think about it. Why? Because it's yours. This is your skating. This is your opportunity. It's you take it home with you. It's beautiful. I go home to my life and do my thing. And then I'm fresh and present and filled up to come share with you again. Mm -hmm. It's a respect thing. I don't, mm -hmm. you know, I don't, don't think that I need to hold on to everybody's things. And also it limits my capacity. If I want to serve the world, I want to serve and make a huge impact with millions of people, which I do. I can't hold millions of people's dreams in my fingertips. And it's also not respectful to do that. It's your dream. You know, I'm part of your team, but you're the, the center of your skating success. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I think for me, I love the idea of that. And I think putting into play might sometimes be for different people more challenging than that sounds. But maybe if I just remind myself of that, because yeah. that I, it's true. It's like you to lot. And, and when you save those moments for the moments that they're the most poignant or important, yeah. you're going to be so connected in that moment because you have, fatigue work fatigue or coaching fatigue or whatever that's naturally going to happen and that's more likely to happen when you carry it home with you and then when you do that then you're not as engaged in the moments when you are with that person yeah and it's, it does come down to respect you respecting yourself right your space mm -hmm. right i the, the let's just face it they're not listening to what i'm saying <laughs> like that's why I never worry about screwing up what I say. And I do this like morning show live every, every day of the week. And I just go off the cuff every day and share what I share, what I can, because they're not listening to what I'm saying. They're feeling my presence and they're feeling the support and then they're grabbing knowledge and they're going and it's theirs. And that, that's how I really view a lot of human interaction. It's, mm -hmm. you know, if I carry this around with me all day, it doesn't make it better. Right. Yeah. And <clears throat> The other thing is, is so much communication. I don't know. You might know this more than me. You probably do, but I don't know what the number is, but it's like uh, what percentage of communication is nonverbal. It's a huge amount. 93. Look at that. See, I knew you'd know. It's a huge, it's 93%. So you get so much from the energy of someone. So much of that. It's not just the words that I utilize or don't utilize. It's like the energy that you feel from someone. And the thing that's amazing is maybe we're getting better at, connecting virtually for one thing and the fact that the camera doesn't make you a blurry blob on the screen is another thing but you <laughs> but you know if we were in if we were on the old cathode ray two <laughs> it's like monitor and you're like you? you look like a tetris symbol maybe it's yes. a little different but i just an nft don't worry you know. right yeah exactly um but but the ability I'm, I'm maybe that makes it easier to connect now virtually but like even in a virtual sense, even with us uh, thousands of kilometers apart, you can still feel that energy from someone. And so much of that isn't what I'm saying. Absolutely. I was teaching yeah. um, a seminar weekend one time. And the first day I got so excited. I just gave it my all and I went all out and, da, 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 and I woke up and I had no voice. Right. It was gone. So when the 40 kids showed up, I had no choice. It was like, there was no projection going to happen. Right. And so I taught them through just movement and just just going around and showing them and doing and you know what this that was probably over 15 years ago and it has become a staple of how i teach i've now used that technique hundreds of times with big groups especially because mm -hmm. telling people to be quiet be quiet be quiet i'm telling i'm talking to you 
totally different than if you don't say a thing and they have to tune in and they have to watch and they have to mm. whisper to each other, what's she doing? What's going on? And right. it's, it transforms the space right. and it creates an, a, a beautiful communication loop that they don't forget. So I've mm -hmm. now I've shared one of my biggest secrets. Anyone listening to the podcast can try yeah. that. Out. Reminds me of a parenting thing. <clears throat> when, if you don't want, if you, if you don't want your kids to hear what you're saying, say it really loud and they aren't yeah. going to pay attention. If you want them to know what you're saying, whisper it to the person beside you. You know, they start to listen so much carefully. You, you can whisper something to someone else and your sibling or your child, they'll come in from a different room and they somehow heard it, but you'll yeah. tell them out loud something and it just goes right by. So it's like, there's something about like people connecting when you, you can have a really good energy level, but when you're soft spoken and trying to impart some information, it somehow comes with more import or that has maybe more depth sometimes. Yeah. It's more, it's more, uh, you can listen to it better as well. Mm -hmm. Right. It's not like berating someone. Yeah. I, I guess I'll just close on saying that it was awesome to have you on and, and thank you for all your fantastic energy and all the knowledge that you imparted. And I hope to, uh, I hope to personally be able to utilize some of what we spoke about today and, and speak in the future. And I'll definitely send you my Detroit style pizza recipe. And I love it. I can't yeah. wait. And Thank I, and so I hope much. you enjoyed it as well. Yes, I did. And then great to meet you. We will yes, chat. You as well. Thank you. Thank you.